Hi, thank you for joining us today on this webinar. My name is Paul Congaldi. I'm a consulting manager specializing in packaging at Nelson Laboratories. Today we will be looking at packaging. We're going to preview package design, um, validation testing, as well as looking at some sterilization methods and design considerations for packaging. A quick look at the agenda. We will look, um, we will evaluate the functions of a package. We'll look at some design considerations. We're going to look at what is the purpose of packaging. We'll preview a few standards. We'll briefly talk about sample size and sample size justifications. And then we'll dive into the test methods. We'll look at distribution testing, shelf life validation, and then strength, integrity, and microbial. And we'll end with revalidation. So let's get started. So basically, what is packaging? Why have a package? If you think about it, there's no any product you make, it cannot get to its end user without any sort of package. Whether it's a cereal box, a bottle of water, a box of nails, and in our case, a sterilized medical device. So what are the functions? There are four basic functions. The first one is to protect the product from hazards in the environment. This is a pretty important function for the package. Does it arrive still sterile? Does it have particulates or microbes or moistures? Does it work functionally? And then as well, the package can also protect the environment from the product. So it goes both ways. So if you're shipping marine pollutants, hazardous material, discarded med medical devices and things of that nature. So that is the function of a package is protection. The second function is containment. This is similar to protection, but it's even if you're shipping something that is non-fragile or non-sterile, it still needs a box to fit into. The next key function of a package is communication. In our case, this is the label on a medical device. It can have items such as product name, lot, description, expiration date, which we'll talk about later, storage conditions, it could have a barcode, QR code, uh, what kind of sterilization it went through, IFUs, and a, but any other type of communication that is needed in the operating room. The last function is usability. A package serves as a means of dispensing the product to the end user. Think of the septic transfer, whether, whereas you know when you're transferring the product on a surgical table, you cannot touch the product, so the package is used as a means of dispensing the product to the nurse or the doctor for use. And outside of medical device, um, cereal boxes, water bottles, these are all a utility function of a package, whereas the product cannot be used with the help of the packaging. Uh, when we design packages, it's, we don't just serve a single function. Uh, usually, it, they cross all four. So that was a brief overview of the functions of a package. So construction. Let's look at what is, what are the components of a full uh, shipping container. We have the primary package. This is the container which comes in direct contact with the contents. So think of a medical pouch. This would be considered a primary package. A secondary package is, is like a shelf carton where it houses the primary container. However, this cannot be shipped by itself. Again, the primary package and secondary package are not shipped together. The shipper, on the other hand, that is the standalone package that can be shipped without any additional protection. So that is what UPS or FedEx or, um, or any kind of a distribution company can pick up and deliver without further protection. An overpack is any packaging that exceeds the minimum requirements. This could be a pallet, such as this picture. It could be a box with a, a bigger box that you put the smaller box in with bubble wrap around it. And it adds convenience, and sometimes it saves costs on shipping. This is considered an overpack. Now, when we talk about packaging, let's look at corrugated fiberboard. Um, this is often misrepresented as corrugate or cardboard. 
It is not cardboard. Uh, corrugated fiberboard comprises of at least one liner, which is the outer surface, and then uh, the medium. These are the flutes inside, which really holds the strength of the corrugated fiberboard. It is typically available in a number of different sizes, A, B, C, E, and F, as you can see on the slides here. The ones used in the medical device industry are usually B and C. Corrugated fiberboard is also available as double or even triple wall. The most combination of it is a BC flute double wall container. This is important to know because there are certain standards that we'll look at in a little bit that depending on what type of strength corrugated you use, and whether it's single or double wall, there are um, certain tests that you do on them or you don't do. So it is important to know what material your packaging is made of. Now, package design, sterilization, and compatibility, um, these are the things we want to consider when we're designing packaging for a medical device. Obviously, you want it to maintain the sterility of the contents until it is used. The packaging has to allow for the sterilant, for example, ethylene oxide, to be able to penetrate and also be properly removed. The packaging should allow direct contact with all surfaces of the product. And obviously, it cannot have any toxic ingredients or non-fast dyes. It has to close completely and securely. So if it's a pouch, it has to be completely sealed. It has to be resistant to tear and punctures you know, during the shipping and distribution environment. Have no lint or any kind of dust. It has to be sufficient size to uh, uniformly distribute the item. And it has to be easy to use and obviously be cost effective. With any packaging consideration, um, you have to consider, as far as medical device goes, is sterilization. Now, there's different ways of sterilization. Uh, the ones that we're going to look at are radiation and ethylene oxide, and what potential effects they could have on the product, the packaging, or the person using them. Let's start with ethylene oxide. The advantages are high penetration. It is compatible with pretty much most sterile barrier systems. It is compatible with many materials, and it is the most commonly used sterilization method out there. The disadvantages are long processing times, because with ethylene oxide, it's gas in, gas out, so not only does it have to penetrate, but then after it penetrates, it can linger in the packaging, so you have to allow it for the aeration portion of it. It is hazardous, it can be carcinogenic, and it is flammable. And then, like I said, you have to worry about residuals uh, during the aeration stage. Design considerations for packaging that's gonna be EO sterilized. It is, you have to have porous material. Ethylene oxide cannot penetrate non-porous uh, materials such as a poly-poly pouch or a foil pouch. Uh, so breathability is a factor. It does introduce humidity, sometimes upwards of greater than 30%. There are pressure changes. There's vacuum spool during the ethylene oxide process. It has long processing times. It could be three to five days, so it is not a quick sterilization method. It is hazardous again. Again, carcinogenic and flammable, and you have to worry about residuals. Radiation, there's gamma and EB. Uh, the advantage of these are there are pretty much no temperature effects, there are no residuals to worry about, and you don't need porous material for either gamma or EB. Potential issues, it could change the material. It does alter, especially in plastics. It can change the tensile test, uh, I'm sorry, tensile strength, Young's modulus, elongation and break force and it can discolor the product. As you can see in the pictures, the little soda bottle there, that was a clear bottle. After being subjected to gamma radiation, it turned amber. And then on the right side, that was a clear uh, plastic container, and it really crystallized and pretty much broke after radiation. So now that we've covered that, let's talk about uh, the, some standards. 
the first one really was introduced in 2006, which was ISO 11607. It was to allow for sterilization, provide an acceptable microbial barrier, allow for a septic presentation, and it is a requirement of the FDA, and soon um, Europe is going to follow with the MDRs and to be harmonized with the ISO 11607. So for control, FDA looks at package failures as event-related. Uh, we're going to talk about this later on, but there are, we don't do sterility tests past, uh, after accelerated aging and performance testing, but we do strength, integrity, and microbial tests. As I mentioned earlier, the standard that governs this is ISO 11607 parts 1 and 2. Part 1 is looks at the material and sterile barrier requirements. Part two looks at forming, sealing, and assembly. The other standards listed on this slide, they're guidance documents to help um, interpret ISO 11607. So you can look at those, and if you have any questions with ISO 607, it'll help guide you through them. As far as responsibility, when you're designing a packaging for any kind of a product, you, um, there's, two, there's the material supplier and there's your company. So what is the material supplier? responsible for. They have to provide you information regarding any kind of physical property, such as porosity, flammability, and things of that nature. They can assist you with validations, and they have to provide you validation data on preformed sterile barrier systems. And then, what is your responsibility? You're responsible for all seals on a form fill seal. You're responsible for your seal on for the seals you make in-house on a pouch or a tray. And then, just as important, you're responsible for all package performance testing, including sterilization, distribution, and the final validation report. Worst case devices. So say you're a medical device manufacturer and you're making catheters of different sizes. Do you have to test and validate all of them? Not necessarily. You're allowed to make a rationale for a worst case device, and it's allowed per ISO 11607. This could be the heaviest product, or it could be the products with, with a sharp end that could potentially penetrate the sterile barrier, or any po other hazards that can uh, compromise that sterile barrier. As far as sample size, sample size is you're, you're required to do a sample size rationalization for any kind of testing for medical devices. Unfortunately, the guidance documents aren't very specific on what sample sizes to use. They just require you to have the justification in-house, and they leave it up to you or your quality department to do the rationale. There is a guidance document, ISO 2859, which was produced in 1999. And this is really an AQL process, and it results in really high numbers of samples. So we don't typically recommend it. When we determine sample size, we have to take into account cost considerations, administrative concerns, what's the minimum acceptance level of deviation, whether you allow one failure or zero, uh, the variability within the population, the method, and the test chosen. When we look at statistics and sample size, there's two types of data. One is attribute or qualitative data. The other one is variable or quantitative data. What do we mean, what do we mean by this? Attribute is data that represents or there are samples that cannot be evaluated with data. For example, if you're doing a bubble leak test, it's a pass-fail test only. There's no data associated with it. Where a variable has this data associated with it, such as a seal peel test, where you can measure the exact um, force that a seal can take. A common approach to sample size determination in our industry is the risk priority number approach. Uh, at this, at the RPN, we look at three factors. One is determine the severity. What is the risk to the patient should there be a breach in the sterile barrier? 
These are rated on a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being the most severe. For example, if there is a potential breach in the sterile barrier and the risk to the patient is that the patient can be permanently damaged or die, then you would assign it a 10. If it's a non-patient contact device and there's no risk to the patient, you would risk, uh, assign it a 1. We also look at the occurrence and the detection values. Uh, we multiply those numbers together and then we correlate them to a non-parametric binomial reliability demonstration test, which comes in with a confidence reliability level. Now, we've always seen sample sizes of 29 or 59, and that's what comes from this portion of it. So for example, if you have, if you determine that you have a moderate risk device, uh, the confidence reliability levels are 95% for each, meaning that you have 95% confidence that 95% of your data is reliable, and that results in a sample size of 59. However, you cannot arbitrarily choose those numbers, and a justification uh, must be determined for those. Let's shift gears and look at a basic packaging plan validation plan right now. There are six steps to do. Early on, you want to obviously do feasibility. You don't want to design all your packaging and then determine that there's a problem. So you can do this in a number of ways. You can do a partial distribution test in a lab, um, or it could be as simple as you know, sending samples, FedEx, from point A to point B and evaluating it. You just want to make sure that you've chosen the right material before you dive into the full package validation. Um, but we also have to ship prior to all performance and stability tests. We perform three tests, strength, integrity, and microbial after any kind of a distribution or an aging test. Uh, we look at time zero samples, and then we do a minimum of three points, baseline, accelerated, and real time. Let's look at test methods now. As I mentioned just now, so we do baseline testing, which is a requirement, and real time aging is a requirement. Accelerated aging can be done as not a requirement, but it helps you get your product to market faster. For example, if you have a shelf life of five years, you don't want to sit and wait five years before you can go to market. So you're allowed to do accelerated aging and go to market much quicker, but then at the same time, you have to do real-time aging. After you're evaluating the sterilization and material compatibility, it's time to challenge the design. Distribution testing is done and looks at the hazards such as temperature, humidity, altitude, shock, vibration, and compression. The most commonly used standards are ASTM D4169, ASTM D7386, ISTA3A, and ISTA2A. The ones that are recognized by both ISO 11607 and the FDA are the ASTM D4169, the D7386, and the ISTA38. The most commonly used ones are the D4169 and ISTA38. They are all designed to simulate hazards in the environment. Essentially, they take all the hazards that a package could see in the distribution environment and they bring it into a lab setting for evaluation. Prior to distribution testing, typically we do climatic stressing. We're subjecting them to hazards of uh, weather hazards out there. Uh, we do an extremely cold test, which is a winter climate, a desert climate, and a tropical climate. ASTM D4332 is one of these standards. And as an example, here are the temperatures. So for winter, the temperature is minus 30 degrees Celsius. For desert, it's 60 degrees C, 15% relative humidity and tropical is 40 degrees C, 90% relative humidity. The ISTA varies slightly, but is very similar. Typically, a, t a conditioning test lasts 72 hours, so we would do 24 hours at each leg, and you were required to do 72 hours. Out of all these conditions, when you're shipping materials that, are, that have corrugated fiberboard or any paper-based product, um, the humidity is the, the tropical climate is the worst case for packaging, and it's typically done at the end. Here's an example of an ASTM D4169 test. I know this is a little bit of an eye chart, and on the next one it will be a little more uh, uh, clear. ASTM D4169 consists of 18 different distribution cycles. These distribution cycles are test plans, and depending on the mode of transportation, the test plans vary. 
for example, if you're shipping by truck only, there's a different te there's a test plan. If you're shipping truck in air, there's a different test plan. If you're shipping pallets less than a truckload, there's a different test plan. But they all consist of the schedules that are listed here on the slide. The first is Schedule A, which is manual handling or drops. This is a drop test. Schedule B and C are compression tests. Schedule D is a stacked vibration test. Schedule E is a vehicle vibration test. Schedule F is a loose load vibration test or a bounce test. Schedule G is rail switching. Schedule H is environmental hazards. Schedule I is low pressure or an altitude test. And Schedule J is the concentrated impact test. Now, if you recall, when I talked about corrugated fiber board and the strength of the corrugated, the Schedule J is a test that can potentially be omitted if the uh, corrugated fiber board of a is of a certain strength or double wall. In addition, Schedule I or the altitude test can be omitted if your primary package is breathable. So if you have a Tyvek poly pouch, Schedule A is not required. But if you have a foil pouch, it is. The most commonly used distribution cycle is distribution cycle 13. It's for motor freight and air packages, so shipments for packages up to 150 pounds. And you can see here, schedule it has schedule A, which is a drop test, has a stacking test or a compression test, schedule C, schedule F, the low pressure test, which is optional um, if your packaging is porous, a vehicle vibration or a random vibration test, which simulates truck and air vibration, schedule J also. Um, which we just talked about, and then a final drop test. Uh, the last thing that we have to determine when we do an ASTM D4169 test is to determine the assurance levels. This is the test severity. Assurance level one is the highest test severity. Assurance two is in the middle. Assurance three is the lowest test severity. The most commonly, you want, uh, commonly used one is assurance level two. If you have a highly sensitive device or you want an extra level of assurance, you can certainly do assurance level one, but we hardly ever do assurance level three on any kind of a sterilized product. Similar to ASTM D4169, we have ISTA3A. In this test plan, they also um, cover environmental conditioning. They call it atmospheric conditioning. They do drop testing. They don't do a standalone compression test, but rather they do a vibration test under a dynamic load, which is you stack the box with the weight and then subject it to the vibration. And they also have an um, option for an altitude test. Within ISTA 3A, there's no distribution cycles. However, the test plan varies depending on what kind of package you have. There's a standard package, which is your normal shipping box. If it's a very small package, it goes through a different test plan. Um, as does elongated and a flat package. And they have definitions be behind all of these in the standard. Looking at the individual distribution test hazards, there's the drop test, as you can see here. Here's a free fall drop test device. It has a pneumatic plate where it falls faster than gravity, allowing the package to impact the surface flat. The most commonly done ones on the packages, for example, for D4169, is the free fall method. If you have elongated packages, you know, you, you're required to do a rotational impact where you stand the package on a short end and let it impact the ground, and then you do a hazard impact where you drop the box on a hazard. Uh, for pallets and unitized loads, uh, we do incline impacts, horizontal impacts, and some vertical impacts as well. Now, when we talk about drop testing also, it's not just people think about drops. It's, that's not the only ha hazard that results in a shock. You know, it could be on a conveyor belt in a sorting facility where the conveyor arm hits the package, causes a shock. It could be a package in a truck where one package impacts another. So it's not necessarily people just dropping them. Uh, so shock events can happen throughout the distribution environment. The compression test text the uh, test the box strength or the stackability of the package. There's a static, and then there's a dynamic. The dynamic one is the one we talked about where you combine it with vibration, where you put the load on top of it, simulating real life conditions. On the static test, there's several different methods. There's apply and release and apply and hold. 
Apply and release has a higher safety factor where the load is usually heavier. Apply and hold, you would put the package or the weight on top of the package and wait for typically periods of up to 24 hours. With the static test, they have factors to account for the dynamic or vibration as well as items such as temperature, humidity. So it's not uncommon for a standard corrugated fiberboard shipper to require strain or stacking capability of over a thousand pounds. And then we have vibration. There's a mechanical shaker, which is the loose load vibration that we mentioned. This is fixed displacement, rotary, and vertical linear. Now these are more legacy tests. They don't necessarily simulate exact road conditions, but they could be used to evaluate the integrity of the product. Uh, the more real life vibration is the random vibration, which is depicted in the picture here. The vibration with using these, this technology is random, so it's never repeated. There's different spectra that the packages are subjected to, such as air, truck, or even rail. When you're shipping your samples to the lab, it's important to consider or to overpack them before you send them for testing. Here's an example of a package that was sent that was damaged prior to testing itself. So this is where it's helpful to put them in an overpack. And the acceptance criteria must also be established by the company sending them for testing. It has to be obviously established prior to the test start. It has to have an evaluation of the damage that occurred. Because, um, and the last comment here that says not a standalone test. So simply subjecting them to a distribution test alone is not enough. You have to evaluate the packages and that's why you have the acceptance criteria in here. The next test we'll look at is accelerated aging. Again, you're required to do real-time aging, but as I mentioned before, by subjecting the packages to elevated temperatures, you reduce the shelf life necessary for them to sit in the chamber. It does not replace real-time aging. The theory is uh, based on the observations of Arrhenius, which is, states essentially for every 10 degrees above ambient, the react reaction rate doubles. So for example, if your, temp um, if your ambient temperature is 25 degrees Celsius, by subjecting it to 35 degrees Celsius, instead of a one-year shelf life, now you, only, you can test it for six months, and so forth. Here's, here is the equation for your review. It's also found in ASTM F1980. Here's a chart um, that lists the different temperatures and the durations. The most common temperature used is 55 degrees Celsius. And you can see here that at 55 degrees Celsius, using an ambient temperature of 25 degrees, the required time in the chamber would be six and a half weeks. The values on this table are in weeks. As far as the ambient temperature, uh, FDA recommends 25 degrees C. The aging temperature, as I mentioned, the most common one is 55 degrees C. You can go up to 60 degrees C, but the standard recommends not exceeding 60 degrees Celsius. It's also important to note that relative humidity has nothing to do with accelerated aging. Uh, we see uh, requests for humidity during accelerated aging, but if you have a high humidity condition, such as 75 or 80 percent, which is often requested at 55 degrees C, this is not a condition that the package will ever see in the environment, and often it can result in premature damage, and you wouldn't know whether the damage was due to humidity or the actual aging. So um, we just do the we keep the relative humidity at ambient. Also, you don't want to you want to make sure you don't exceed the glass transition rate for polymers because then you will affect the product the packaging as well. So let's say you have you have you're required to do five five year aging, and then at the end of the aging your package failed. Well, what do you do? How does this affect your real-time aging? What our recommendation is, is if you have extended shelf lives to do pulls at shorter intervals. For example, if you have a shelf life of five years, do a pull at one year, do a pull at three year, and then do your final five-year val validation. So like if your five-year package validation fails, then you can always fall back on a three-year shelf life and a one-year shelf life. 
So we've talked about uh, distribution testing as well as accelerated aging and real-time aging. So how do we validate the results? As I mentioned in, uh, before, these are not standalone tests, so we need test methods to evaluate. For ISO 11607, you need to do a, at least one strength test, one integrity test, and one microbial barrier test. Strength tests include seal peel, burst, and creep. The integrity test consists of visual inspection, dye migration, dye immersion, or a bubble test. And the microbial barrier tests are ASTM F1608, microbial challenge, and ASTM F2638. And we will look at each of these methods. So let's start with the strength tests. The first one we'll look at is the seal peel test. And the standard is ASTM F88. Two seals are typically tested. One is the manufacturer seal, and the other one is the seal you make in-house. Testing for both makes easy acceptance criteria because you want to make sure that the, your in-house seal is at least the same or higher than the manufacturer seal. The test involves measuring a one-inch segment of the package along the seals, and then uh, results are typically recorded in force pounds per inch. Here's a picture of uh, what a typical seal sample looks like from a pouch. The most rigid material usually moves, puts its put in the mobile grips and the most flexible in the stationary grips. It's important whenever you do seal peel testing or any other testing in general that everything is consistent. So you wanna make sure the same jaw separation rate is used. So during a peel test, you wanna make sure that always you use the same method. So as far as the most rigid material being placed in the mobile grips. And then we'll look at some test methods and you wanna make sure that the, the techniques you can use for the seal peel test are always consistent. As far as establishing minimum seal strength, that's up to you. You can work with your packaging supplier to do it. You can do a validation, you can do a low anomaly and high. Um, don't choose a seal minimum seal strength value that's too high use something realistic. The industry uses often uses one pound per inch, but that's not based on any data. It's traced back to the paper industry. So make sure you choose an adequate seal peel test when you conduct this testing. The three methods are this uh, 90 degrees unsupported method when you do a seal peel test. As you can see here, the tail is free flowing. This is usually the most conservative and the most often conducted approach. The next one is a 90 degree supported is where, where it's held manually. We hardly do this. Uh, it doesn't, it's off, oftentimes it yields inconsistent results. Uh, the other one is the 180 degree supported where you put a back plate when you do the peel test. Again, you want to use the same method throughout all your tests. Here's an example of an overseal which, cause, which causes issues when it comes with packaging. As you can see, overseals as a result too high of temperatures causing melting, bending of material, and voids in the seal. Here's an example of delamination. It's not necessarily failure, but it's, it's often rejected in the operating room and it can result in dusting. Some upcoming changes, ASTM F88 in our lab study is in the process for trays, so a separate test method will be used for trays and pouches, and also ASTM is looking at differences and similarities between units of pounds per inch or um, units per millimeter. The next strength test is the burst slash creep test. This is performed by pressurizing the package until a burst a seal is bursts. Uh, burst values can be affected by pouch size. Larger pouches often give lower values. Pouch configuration, whether it's the top of the pouch is down, or the, or, I'm sorry, the, the Tyvek portion is out versus the uh, poly side being up. Material type, porous versus non-porous. Airflow rates can affect uh, burst values, as well as restraining plates used in the test method. A creep test is similar to a burst test. However, um, it doesn't, we don't go all the way to the point where the package is burst. First, uh, we would, conduct several pouches and take them to failure, and then test them at 80% of that value and make sure that they don't burst. 
obviously the burst, uh, the burst test may precede the creep test. Um, we're going to look at integrity tests next. Vision, uh, the first one is visual inspection. This is ASTM F1886. This is where pack, uh, packages are um, checked visually for any defects in the seal. The test engineers or the technicians or analysts should be properly trained to look for these leaks. There should definitely be adequate lighting. A sample can take anywhere from one to five minutes to look uh, to inspect, and the observations are documented. Here are some examples of failures that were seen during a visual exam uh, evaluation. Here's an example of an open seal. This could have resulted from package misalignment, equipment malfunction, defects within the material or foreign body in the seal, or even a seal rupture. Here's an example of a tray that has a non-homogeneous seal. You can see clear spots in the seal and the top seal. This is probably due to insufficient heat pressure or too short of a dwell time. This one, it was obvious, it's tray misalignment, and then you have internal creep due to warping of the tray. Here's an example of a leak of a channel through the seal that was observed during visual inspection. And then this was pretty easy to spot. This is an overseal. Now, a lot of people think an overseal is okay because it's sealed, right? However, when we do dye uh, testing, uh, we can see the dye migrating through the seal. So an overseal will result in breaches in sterile integrity. The next test we'll look at is the dye migration test. This is ASTM F1929. Uh, F it involves injecting a dye into the package and then rotating it and looking for channels through the seal. There are three methods. There's injection method A, where you, uh, using a syringe, you put the liquid or the dye into the pouch and then you examine it for leaks. Method B is the edge dip test, which is this is where you dip the pouch or the tray in a dye solution and through capillary motion, the dye is absorbed through the channel and uh, uh, channel leaks could be identified. And there's an eyedropper method, method C. This one's not often conducted. Typically, it's either method A or method B. The dye migration test is very sensitive. As you can see, it, could, it can detect channel leaks down to 50 microns. When conducting the test, we have to be um, cognizant of not leaving the dye at the seal too long. Otherwise, it will cause wicking, and then you will not know whether the dye has wicked through the seal or it's actual channel leak. There's ASTM F3039, F3039, but this is for non-porous packaging. The previous test was for porous packaging. And then this is also similar. We inject the dye solution into a foil or a poly poly pouch and then look for leaks. What do you do with a double pouch system? This one's since the dye penetration or dye mig uh, migration test looks at the seals only. It's not a whole package integrity. It looks at the, we, we evaluate the seals only. You can cut the interior without damaging the seals, uh, test the pouch, and then you can do the edge the test on the outer pouch. There's a dye immersion test. These are for vials and rigid containers. Um, it's, in the tank. it's only in, uh, for rigid containers. You cannot put flexible containers in here. This is where the samples are uh, put into a dye, cleaned, and then put through a vacuum. And then we, uh, using a UV, we look for any kind of leaks through or if any of the dye migrated into the vials. It cannot be used with drug, uh, drug products that are viscous or oily. The bubble emission test is one that's probably done most often. This involves inflating the package and submerging it underwater. And then we, uh, and then any bubbles that are noted through any seals or the body of the pouch can determine if there's any gross leaks. Here are some leaks that are found through the bubble emission test. Also, when we're testing Tyvek, um, has to be, we have to be careful because there's normal breathing that happens through the, sh uh, through the actual Tyvek. So we, uh, essentially we, what we do is we make a known failure 
and then find the adequate test pressure and then subject the packages to that. The last one we're going to look at is microbial test. And these, this is also a requirement of ISO 11607. The first one we'll look at is microbial ranking for ASTM F 1608. Uh, the sample size is actually listed in the standard. A minimum of two is required. However, they have to be a minimum of 47 millimeters in width. The packages are placed into a chamber and exposed to the silicitrophius, and then they're filtered and then evaluated, and the, and the log reduction value is determined for the porous material. This is a, te a test for porous material only. It cannot be done on non-porous materials. And then the values are usually compared between baseline and after shelf life and after distribution. If you have a non-porous package, such as a poly pouch, uh, we can do the microbial aerosol challenge. Uh, these packages are placed into an aerosol chamber and also exposed to that same bacillus atrophius. The contents are then tested for the presence of abs or absence of the indicator organism. There's three types. First is the indicator uh, indicator testing. First is the immersion. Uh, this is where you take the device and place it into the media. The next is the flush method, where you take the media and use a pump to flush it through the system, incubate the media, and look for growth. And the final one is the media fill. This is usually the easiest one to do. There's no manipula manipulation. They're simply pre-filled and then tested. There's also the next one. There's an ASTM F2638. This is similar to the ASTM F1608, but uses a lower flow rate. Uh, we need a, a minimum of a 4x4 four four, uh, sample, and this is also for porous materials only. These are the three microbial tests. Um, finally, we're going to look at revalidation. So package validation, once it's done and then there's no changes in the material or in your packaging, you don't need to revalidate. However, you should uh, periodically evaluate your packaging to see if there was any changes in the manufacturing process and the device itself and the sterilization method. Some changes are so minor that revalidation is not required, but you should definitely keep records and justifications for why you didn't revalidate, maybe a partial revalidate validation is needed where only a distribution test is needed or only aging is needed. Uh, you should definitely periodically review it, even though you might have a justification because the changes are so minor. But then if you, over the years, if you have several small minor changes, they could result into a bigger change. Now you require revalidation. This brings us to, um, to the end of our presentation. Uh, thank you for joining. Should you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us. Thank you for listening.